Diane, I think the Barthelon cyst was in your... <laughs> it wasn't. Like, I got so many questions about Barthelon cysts. Oh my cysts. gosh, yeah. There were, so do you need that drain for Barthelon cysts? The answer is yes. You need a drain for Barthelon cysts. The ward is, has the longest sort of track record. It's, it's, it's needed to keep it open enough to drain. These things are a big deal. Um, and if they don't heal well, they eventually may need marsupialization, which is a pretty yucky surgery to have to have done. So yes, you need a catheter in there. There have, have been studies looking at a loop drainage catheter which was something somebody brought up. That's an alternative, although frankly, I think comfort is something that needs to be talked about with the patients. It needs to stay in there a while. Um, so, and you may have an OBGYN who feels very strongly one way or the other about what they want in there. But the reality is, yes, you need a drain in these things. They have much better success rates. You can't just IND them. They recollect too much. So your failure rate's too high. So yes, you need eye drain. Do you have any tips for comfort? Okay, sorry, were you yeah. going to go there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the worst I, part about the procedure, in my opinion. I might be a weirdo. I actually really enjoy this procedure. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, how odd for saying that. But um, yes, these like this is excruciatingly painful. And just putting that lidocaine in there, like t anywhere else lidocaine burns and it stings, but like there really hurts. So I always yeah. give these patients morphine. I always warn them, hmm. but I think the location of where you make this incision is mm -hmm. huge, right? A lot of times this is a big bulging area and people cut straight into the labia. That is not gonna drain these. That's also gonna cause a lot of um, cosmetically uh, not well appearing tissue. So you really need to, and sorry this is graphic, but you need to pull the labia and your incision is much more medial than yeah. you think it is. Yeah. I see a lot of junior learners go and like try to stab the labia. That's not how you approach these. You really have to go to that mucosa in the inside of the labia yeah. and the incision is much more medial. Much, clo much closer to the introitus. And, and, and then the benefit, which I mentioned in the lecture, is you can take that ward catheter and pop it up into the vagina itself so it's not hanging down and uncomfortable for the weeks that they have to have this thing in. And the other thing with the ward catheter, some people will take, to blow up the balloon, they'll take a syringe with a needle attached <laughs> to the end. That's gonna pop things. So you actually don't want to put the needle in there to insert air. You want to use one of those, oh, what are they called? Like the dolphin porpoise yeah. nose mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, ends of the syringe to blow it up, not with a needle. The needle is technically easier, but you run the risk of popping the balloon. Indeed. What, one thing I'd just add with, um, and not just for Bartholin cysts, but for any kind of like abscess cyst kind of collection that you're going to uh, do an incision with is use ultrasound for it because sometimes you'll find like the better spot to hit and uh, not all things that are fluctuant are actually abscesses and not all things that are firm are cellulitis. And um, with the uh, Bartholin cysts, it sometimes help me, helps me with uh, also seeing where might actually be the best spot, where it's the safest spot for cutting because it's also a very vascular area too. Yeah. So, and, and you can use your color Doppler on uh, the ultrasound to help kind of catch those areas too. So that would be my additional tip is use ultrasound, which I always And do. color for fun. And with color with it, yeah. Okay, <laughs> I found a question that you can't just say use ultrasound for. It's this next one, okay? What is the name <laughs> of the app that gives you practice EKGs? There's not one app, there's many. We can kind of start over in Scott. Scott, do you have a favorite resource you'd like to share with people about learning EKGs? 100%, I think probably one of the definitive practice resources is called Wave Maven. Uh, it's out of Harvard and it has difficulty levels from like, this is the first time I've seen an EKG in my Great life name. to um, I am like a 25 year cardiology attending and I still don't know the answer to these. Uh, and they provide clinical vignettes, they go through detailed explanations and I think it's a resource that has over 1200 different ECGs. It could be really wave helpful. Maven. Wave Maven, ride the wave. Awesome. Yeah. And this is a free website. Free right? website. It's not an app, it's a website mm -hmm. that you can get. So that's cool. Anybody else have their favorite like learning tool for EKGs? There's Life a lot of other websites out there. Life in the Fast Lane. Life yeah. in the Fast Lane has a great option. That's good. There are other resources out there too that are kind of like an EKG of the week type things. So I think it's ECG Weekly, I think is yeah. Amal Matu's website. Mm -hmm. I think that is a paid resource. Um, Dr. Stephen Smith, Dr. Ken Grauer, G-R-A-U-E-R, -E both have a like EKG of the Week website that is free, has great commentary. Those are great places to go to. So lots of places. And it's just nice to get like a little drip of EKG goodness every week to kind of get something really new, is. you know? Because, I mean, like it's... It's hard just to learn EKGs one time and go like, okay, I got it. Well, they, so and they many, keep changing what's, what's abnormal, so it's good. But yes, like all these 2021, 22 papers are 
critical mm -hmm. for the modern fraction emergency medicine to know these 2021, 2022 papers that have come out from AHA, ACC. And so look for those. We talk about them on the two view. And so if you don't know what those are, uh, you know what, I'll just drop in the chat for this afternoon links to these new papers because they are critically important talking about, like literally they're called the evaluation and diagnosis of chest pain in the emergency department. Like, hello, this is written <laughs> for us, okay? So we got to know these. We got to yeah. know them real well. And I think an interesting and important point about learning ECGs is like interpretation of an ECG is not, it's a skill. It's not just acquiring knowledge, right? And so I implore people to deliberately practice the skill and finding a resource that is testing you and not just like reading a little bit about what VTAC looks like is great, but like mm -hmm. when you get the ECG, it's not a little paragraph on what it looks like. It's asking you to make an imperfect decision with like a scrumply piece of paper, all those things. So really practicing the skill of interpretation, getting the feedback is the fastest way to build your ability yeah. as opposed to a more passive learning. You know, like you wouldn't try to learn how to play tennis by just reading a book about it, right? You would actually get out there and hit the ball a button. It's also worth grabbing all those that are always sitting on the counter of the ER. They're like scattered everywhere. And you, just take a peek. I mean, they're everywhere, right? Just take a peek. So eye testing. Right, like ideally you have an eye chart somewhere in your department, but there are these patients who can't even read the big E. So what do you do? You can still get a visual acuity. You can have them count fingers. Hey, how many fingers am I holding up at one foot, three feet, six feet, nine feet, 12 feet? And you can document that. And well, that's a do. way, right? Please do. You gotta do something, because I often get that, well, the nurse will come back out and say like, they can't read the chart. And that's fine, I'm not mad at the nurse, but like you can either educate the nurse or whoever to do that, or you can just go in and do, the, and, and do it yourself, and then you document in your section. Could not read eye chart, but can read fingers to X, Y, Z. Well, and there's the an right order, right? The there's eye. no light perception, which is the worst thing. Mm -hmm. Then there's hand motion, which is kind of the next one. Then there's count fingers, which is the next one, and then you get onto the Snellen chart. But that's, and I'll tell you, when you talk to an ophthalmologist, you go and you say the patient can't, can't read the chart, they're gonna say, can they count fingers? Can they see light? They're gonna ask you that. That's their, sort of their sequence of, that, when, they see, when you see NLP on an, on an optho note, that means no light perception, the patient can't see, like really can't see. And I would also just make a plug for um, checking for visual field defects. So like we were talking yeah. about in the stroke, you know, they can't see, they have visual changes. Well, again, is it Flashers, floaters, are they sensitive to light? Can they not see in one eye? Is the whole left field just cut completely? Like visual changes that you need to specify and be specific about what exactly is missing. Yeah, and people will interpret a visual, like they, they'll interpret a visual field cut as I can't see out of that eye. So a person may come in and say, I can't see out of my left eye. But what they're interpreting of not seeing the left field of vision is that, that eye isn't working. So your, your testing of them is going to give you, the, what, what, where is it? Is it the eyeball or the brain? These are all good points. It goes beyond just a number or the number of fingers, how far it can go. It can even go worse than can't count fingers, even. Tetracaine, more tales of tetracaine from the ER here. Okay, somebody did not refrigerate tetracaine after it was opened and it got contaminated. I'm sure someone, something really bad happened here, it sounds like. There's okay. a story. I want to know the story behind this one. <laughs> his, his eye fell out. I'm sure yeah. his eye just clean fell out of his head at one point. Now, I want to ask, does anybody routinely send a patient with tetracaine? No. No. I sometimes will send, depending on the follow-up case, like with diluted preparacaine, um, it, but it's really case-by-case -case basis, you know? Uh, and I think like diluted enough with somebody who I know is not just gonna be like dumping it in their eye and then yeah. like rubbing sand in their eye. You know, a lot of the massive bounce back ulceration studies, like that's a big fear, right? Like you give it a whole bunch of them, tetracaine, preparacaine, they can't feel anything, things get worse, they don't follow up, and then they eventually go blind because of this giant ulcer, are like case reports from like the 60s and 70s. Yeah. So, you know, I know there's not a great body of literature saying like this is safe for patients, but I also think like reasonable people with low quality evidence that shows harm, I still do it on a case by case basis. I wish we had those little eensy bottles that only have like a day's oh, yeah. worth of <laughs> yeah, those. Yeah, the three droppers. Those yeah. would be great, but you get yeah. drops. Exactly. <laughs> so we, uh, um, I, I will do the same thing case by case for the, the tetracaine, but have that discussion, document that discussion. But our ophthalmologists actually really like Ketorolac, ophthalmic. Huh. Mm -hmm. So, because um, it, it does help with pain control. Um, Isn't it expensive? Long. So we provide it in our department. Oh, you're awesome. So, yeah, there are certain things Free because we, because I yeah. gave them the first dose yeah. in the department. I can so them give the them the, the bottle. bottle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so you're not so keeping the, it in your coat pocket like this person. No, no, no. Okay. no. <laughs> for the next one to just keep spreading yeah. the spreading the love of verse or whatever. It's going to be there. Our favorite skeptic Ken Milne did a podcast <laughs> with 
Dr. Glockenflecken. So if you at all watch medical uh, social media, he is the really funny ophthalmologist who does a lot of stuff. So Dr. Glockenflecken was on uh, Ken's podcast, and they talked about topical ophthalmic tetracaine, okay? Mm -hmm. And he even convinced Will Flannery that Okay, maybe it's not a terrible idea. <laughs> it wasn't okay. a huge hit, though. What's that? The yeah, it, was a, it was a begrudging. If, yeah, exactly. It was like, I guess. <laughs> I just want to yeah. know, like, when one of the ophthalmologists gets a little abrasion, like, what are they doing? Oh, you, you know, know what they, they do? do? Oh, they're giving them you know what they do, you know right? Exactly it's that. like yeah. the same thing we do at our own, for our own yeah. health and our own families. It's <laughs> like, anyway. <laughs> Great comment here. I must be a public exam master because I get pulled out to do these all the time. All right. So yeah, maybe you're just like a whiz with the, um, you know, whatever, but um, cervical motion tenderness or whatever else. But, but yeah. yeah. So I wanted to bring this up in this context. All right. <laughs> the idea of the PA and the NP being used to do the dirty work in the ER. Okay. And this is a really difficult situation, uh -huh. you know, and I, I have mixed feelings here. You know, sometimes a, a physician will come to me and say, I've got a patient with really bad lack. That, that I, they're working the primary on, can you fix the laceration, right? And I, I have mixed opinions here, okay? So like number one, if somebody has a lack in the ER, who's probably repairing that lack? It's probably, honestly, it's the PA or the NP. Like, let's be real about that, in most ERs, okay? So in terms of like, you know, repetition and, and time on the sutures here, like maybe it's the PA, NP. Number two, if I want somebody out of the net, like occupied at bedside doing a procedure for a long time, I'm okay if it's me. Like, I'd rather it be me than the physician I'm working with. It's just me and a doc, and that's it in an ER, which is not unusual mm -hmm. for me. But what I would say this, if you find out this position, what I recommend is this. It's like, yeah, like, I, I think I can do that. Here's what I'm working in the meantime. I've got this patient with chest pain, this patient with abdominal pain, waiting on a CT. This person's got a bad eye. This person's whatever. So if you can cover down on those things, happy to fix this laceration. Because they need to know too what you are doing. Because the last thing they want is this patient decompensating and you're up to your eyeballs and you know, like proline and, and this patient decompensates and they're like, wait, what's going on with this patient? They need to know what you're doing just like you know what they're doing as well. I, I do the same, same thing there as far as, and, and also kind of a give and take of like, hey, there's you know, a few people that still need to be seen. You know this is gonna take me a while because like nail bed lacerations where you have to do like, all the steps where you have to take off the nail, then you have to, to repair it, you know, and, and all, all those things. I mean, to do it well, especially if it's a pretty kind of mangled one, uh, it's an hours long process. So you can be tied up for that hour, but what's happening with the patients in between? So I'll say like, hey, there are a couple of these I haven't signed up for, or I just signed up for right before you came and asked me to do this, which is okay, but like, can we maybe do something here as a, as a compromise? And, and usually that, that works out well. You know, this is interesting because th this is, if you're acting as a parallel provider, what the hell are they doing asking you to do a procedure? It's, if you're a parallel provider, that's their patient. They should be doing that. And this is, unless it's a way that yeah. your system is set up where it's an okay thing to do, that, yeah. I don't know, that's kind of appalling. That, that's the, I'm sorry. Oh, no, I was going to say, I've worked with NPs and PAs the entire time I've been a doctor, and I've never asked them to do a no. procedure for me. So that's, ever. A, that's no. the funny thing I was going to say. That's the rub. That's the, and I think that's probably where, where Mike's, reservation is with two like I don't like being asked that like if it's one of the more simple straightforward lacerations where yeah you just need to spend 10 minutes in the room to do it like I would expect you to do that but if it is something that uh, I think as Mike's alluding to too if you're in these departments where that's being done and you are spending you have more of that experience and more of that time then it can make sense for doing that like I was mentioning um, in, in my spot like I do all the innovations for about half of our positions too. So, and I'm, I'm more than happy with that. Like I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. I, I managed a lot of the minute to minute critical care side of critical care, um, but that's because that's where my experience has been. Mm -hmm. And so I take that as a positive, but I also realize that sometimes that, that can be a detriment to the other patients I have, or that can be, uh, you know, sometimes a detriment for that person who is passing up on that exam or, or that procedure, I mean. Uh, but, but it is one of those, like, I can see the positive there, and I'd rather have me fix it who has more experience than the person who's saying, like, I really don't know what I'm doing here. Like, if, if, you, if you tell me that you, you, you don't feel comfortable doing that procedure just because you don't have as much What does that person there, do when you're not there? So that is a great question, and that is, that's something that I, uh, I sometimes bring up, too. But 
uh, uh, the, I don't the know. first, the fir just as a real quick aside, the first department that, that I worked at, like I said, it was a critical access hospital. I lived two minutes away. I got called in in the middle of the night. Like I was like the on-call critical care person, basically. So we had all these family med physicians who would call to have me come in to manage those patients. So I don't know what they, they did afterwards after mm. I left that place, but it was, it, it had me more concerned because of that, because of the fact that there wasn't anyone else who was doing that, what do, what do they do the rest of the time? Mm. So it's a good point. Yeah, I think it's, um, I mean, in the initial question here, I, I think it's entirely inappropriate to have somebody else perform like an exam on your patient, because no. like, uh, yeah, and the whole I'm, point I'm of hoping, the exam is I getting... thought the context of this question was more, yeah. they like save the pelvic exam patients, like oh, the whole okay. thing gotcha. for me, which was what it, as, a, as the first woman who worked in a bunch of ERs where I've yeah. worked, they, uh, somehow I would come in at three and there'd be like six <laughs> yeah. patients who needed pelvic You'll never believe what just walked in. In the yeah. rack. Yeah. Yeah. Right, sure. exactly. But, so, but I, if this is really just saying, I saw the patient, will you just go do the pelvic? Yeah, it's that's like, uh, what? entirely that absurd. I think that that's really? like, uh, I mean, oh, I'm that's mortified. inexcusable. Um, you know what, I've Ugh. certainly never asked somebody else to do a procedure on one of my patients, but I can say like, there are times mm. though I think a team effort for managing the department can be really helpful, right? Where maybe there is this like raging lack that's like massive and it's gonna take a bunch of times back and forth and you know, maybe another colleague I'm working with is up front in triage and they're just having a really hard time. They're not seeing all the patients, you know, and I'd be able to swap spots with them and maybe clear out the waiting room and the time it takes them to do that lack and hey, like if we switch roles, it this be better for both of us, better for the patients that we have. There, I think there are reasonable compromises to make on a team sometimes, but it's about that communication about respect for what each brings to the team um, but certainly like to just outsource stuff because you don't want to do it or it's hard to do like I think that's time to hang up the gun belt man you know it's, yes. it's time to what? put the stuff scope away you and, know? sorry not to belabor this point but <laughs> it, it, it's a sensitive exam and you're trying to build rapport and connect with this patient and then all of a sudden you just send in somebody totally random like hey pull down your pants I need to do a pelvic exam like that's just not good patient care so for all those reasons that we've yeah. already talked about, I just don't think. And if it's happening to you, thing. I apologize for all of the sort of people asking you to do that. What the heck is happening? That's I, just I, bad. I say the only, <laughs> only time that that even should come up is like by patient requests of that. Yeah, that's and, fine. And, that, and that's, that's very, very different than what I imagine because unfortunately I get to, to witness this in my department because we're predominantly men, but the very few women we have in our department, literally it'll be either saving it like you're talking about or it, oh yeah, I talked to them about it and they'd rather have a woman instead. Like, I want to be in that room for that conversation because I'm sure that conversation was very different than the way it was just yeah. presented. Yeah, we have a woman doctor coming on. You would like that person to take do your exam, right? Right. Right. Yeah. 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 right, technology is really coming along these days and so there are things you can plug on the outside of your smartphone and do the work that other devices used to do. You have to buy them, you know, individually. Anybody know about this digital otoscopes or other things you can plug into your smartphone that you like using that are becoming I, more I've popular? I've seen it. I haven't used it. I would like to say that I just reread this the otoscope. I thought it was ophthalmoscope last time. I bet so they mean a I put in, but I don't know. So I put in like, oh, point of care ultrasound is perfect for this, but not so much for an otoscope <laughs> exam. My apologies. Like, not as good. Uh, uh, ophthalmoscope, yes. Like... <laughs> I have to be careful with some of these things too. Sometimes they're expensive and not what you expect. So and then there's a lot of this kind of stuff out there. There's a lot of people trying to do their little startup things. So yeah, I have seen one of these used once before for foreign body removal from the ear where like, a tri like doing a blind removal or it was really difficult to get a small enough cone with an otoscope in there and it was like a little fiber optic camera. I think there's some niche utilizations for those things. But in reality, I, I mean, I I just use what's on the wall to look at the ear, and it seems... If, if it's on the me. wall that yeah, day. Yeah, you know, or, I mean, if it works. <laughs> if it's, like, if it's on, not being like, sold on eBay, yeah, somebody just stole it. Yeah, 90% of the it. time, it doesn't have batteries charged or whatever. <laughs> Did the fiber camera plug into a phone, or was it an independent thing? Yeah, it was something to plug into the phone. It oh, went dope. into an iPhone. It was pretty cool. I forgot what it was called. Um, and then I was like, that's great. I guess, are you going to, like, go home and wash that now? Yeah. Like, what's the follow-up <laughs> well, with this? Or you just, like, throw it out and spend another $500? I don't know. So, you know. <laughs> Okay, having your own, uh, you know, retainer, medical attorney for just, just in case you get sued, I suppose. Um, I would say this, a lot of your medical malpractice insurance comes with this, okay? They have somebody on retainer by the insurance company, so if you get a letter from somebody, the medical board or uh, an attorney, you know, coming after you, you contact your medical insurance company and say, this is the letter that I got how do we usually handle this? And 
that's what happened to me. Okay, I got a letter from the medical board saying I had a complaint against me, and so my next call was to the uh, medical malpractice uh, insurance, and they said, no problem. That day, somebody gave me a call, and we talked through it, and over the course of the next year, this really, <laughs> like, ridiculous complaint Aww. finally got solved, but it, like, hung over my head for a year, which kind of sucked. Uh, what would have sucked more is paying money to handle that, me paying money to handle that, okay? Mm -hmm. It was hard enough on my, my stress level. Any thoughts in general from the panel here mm -hmm. about independent insurance, independent um, consultation with people outside of what usually comes with your medical malpractice I, insurance? I would say that usually it's not necessary. Even your own hospital's risk management team, which is, should include, like even the smallest of hospitals I've worked at and stuff always has some attorney that they have. And uh, the, ho the hospital has an interest in helping you and protecting you. And most of the times they will actually get you out of depositions um, because the, the hospital doesn't want you to be deposed uh, for various reasons. But one of the, one of the <laughs> big ones is because it, uh, depositions can be pulled up later. So uh, if you ever have to do depositions, just realize that your deposition in one case can be used in another case as well. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the hospital <coughs> wants to limit that as much as possible. And uh, usually their own legal team will get involved and if they're not automatically involved because they, they didn't get papers sent to them, which usually most attorneys, um, as an ethical rule for attorneys, they have to, if that, if that other party has an attorney, they're supposed to be contacting attorney to attorney. So in, in theory, they should already know what's going on. They won't always know because they won't always know the attorney who's the point of contact on the other end. But if you ever get asked to get deposed or if you get involved in any other kind of legal matter, uh, making sure that your, uh, your hospital knows so that their risk management, which includes their attorney, gets involved, as well as most commonly most insurance policies have their own separate attorney from that hospital attorney. And usually you'll have both attorneys who are going to have their their viewpoints, and like I said, a lot of times they're gonna work on getting you out of saying anything to another attorney. I feel like that's generally the right answer is no, don't. Does anybody say yes? I think the one time it could be beneficial, not prophylactically, no. uh, you know, I think you're gonna, listen, I'll take that money from you. You know, like you're gonna spend a lot of money for something that you won't use, and then when you do need it, you've got insurance for it. Um, but I do think that there are some times where you might be in a position where the hospital insurance policy and the lawyers that are there might have a different protected interest than your own. Yep. Um, there are some policies like working, for instance, for a county facility where because it's a self-insured group that you might waive some of the decision making yeah. like ability here. So they might say you waive your right to a trial if we decide to settle because we're insuring this whole thing. Uh, and that's great for them. But ultimately, if you don't want like a settlement, on your like record yeah. or have to deal with that, you might need independent counsel to continue to push something through. Yeah, that, so that would be the one time where there's a difference. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit yesterday. There's, it's similar. That's that's the one time you have to be a little bit self-serving and mm -hmm. and really, really stake out your own this may part be of a that. State law difference. Then, <clears throat> I know at least in Missouri, they they can't settle without your permission. Hmm. So right. that, know that, your local laws. Yeah. Then, so that sure. that goes back to knowing the laws because um, the. There's an ethical principle that the attorney who is representing you should be representing your interest. Now, given the hospital, like you're saying, the hospital interest could be different than your personal interest. Your liability insurance attorney should be in your personal interest. Um, so that, that can create some conflict there. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess if you live in a state where, where they can make a settlement without you, that, that could be a role there. But in, at least in Missouri and, and other states that I've taken the time to look mm -hmm. at this, um, they can't make a settlement, you know, they can receive offers of things all the time, but they can't make a settlement without your permission mm -hmm. because of how it gets reported. If you, if you have a, a settlement that's against, or you have a claim made against you, that goes into uh, uh, the national provider database. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's said settled with the hospital, then it won't actually end up in the mm -hmm. national provider database if you're not specifically named. Another kind of random thing. We do some OBGYN topics in the Advanced Emergency Medicine Bootcamp course, which you can get by streaming. We're not running a live yeah, course of that not this, this year. year. We'll see about next year. I don't know if maybe, you know, we can't just address OB here on the panel. Are there any like next level OB tips, really just tricks from prolonged practice? Like, see, I, the, the thing is, I don't know what they mean by no, this. I know, yeah, right? They're like, so. Resources in general. Yeah. Resources yeah, I, I mean, this is like my favorite topic in emergency medicine. I know it's Diane's too. Um, and so there are, we can put in the Slido like 
references to, I know you've written a bunch of Corpendium book chapters mm -hmm. and other chapters um, and publications just for those. I think ACOG, uh, the American College yeah. of Obstetrics and Gynecology is a great start, but that sometimes isn't necessarily in like the emergency medicine perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. It'll be, it's an amazing resource and it'll be great for antibiotics for UTIs and management, like acute management, but sometimes it goes into like more clinical stuff and long-term follow-up that isn't necessarily pertinent to us as ED practitioners. Um, and I, I, I work for MRAP, so I'll be full <laughs> disclosure about that. But in Corpendium, there's a new pharma section. And I will say a lot of the uh, resources for antibiotics or different medications will always waver on like, well, you could give it to pregnant people, <laughs> but the baby might die. Or you might get a cleft palate. And so they, they really waver on that. And I would say one of the features from the pharma part of uh, Corpendium is that it kind of gives more definitive stance on you can give it, you can give it at a lower dose, you shouldn't give it, don't give it to someone breastfeeding. I feel like you get a little bit more of a straightforward answer that you can rely on other than the like, well, maybe, but maybe not kind of answer. Um, so I think if I can in the Slido, I, can, I would definitely yeah, attach you. some resources for you, but I would say overall, ACOG in general mm -hmm. is really, really great coming from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, but it will focus sometimes on the emergency management and beyond. Yeah, and it sounds like the, the person who asked this question at, did a little more sort of elucidation later and talked about people that get referred to OB to, be see, to either be seen or shifted over to the OB side of, some, of a place, and they were getting criticized for doing that, and I don't know in what circumstances. I'm not sure if it's longer term, you know, high, further along yeah. in pregnancy, if it's rural mm -hmm. ectopics, so I'm not exactly sure where and if the individual who wrote that question can, wants to come up and talk later, we can absolutely help if you know the best we can. Yeah, or put the in in the th the three p.m. section. Put more specifics on what was like a few cases where OB was like, "Why are you sending this to us? This is an ER, you know." Because I've had that happen before too. It's like you know, OB doesn't want to get involved because they think that we should be managing it completely. And sometimes and some things I we should get that. Yeah. And sometimes you have to say, "I'm uncomfortable managing this mm -hmm. completely, and I'm requesting your help with this patient." Would you please come see this patient? Yeah. Sometimes you have to kind of put the foot down civilly. Yeah. And right. sometimes it's just it, institutional guidelines. Like yeah. over a certain number oh, yeah, of weeks, yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter what it is, OB takes it. It goes to OB. Or it's exactly. your turf, so. Can I interrupt before the next question? Of course. So there's a question that's not on here that came up that I really want to address, which is docs prep. So this idea for STI prophylaxis that is now, it's been in every news story out there everywhere. It's on all the news feeds on social media. It's this idea that we can use doxycycline as a post-sexual activity prophylaxis for STIs successfully. And I will tell you that it is not ready for prime time, but everyone's gonna start asking for it because it is out there in the news. The studies are in a very, very specific patient population of men who have sex with men and transgender women. They're small so far. I think there's a lot of potential here, but it is one of those things that this horse ran so far out of the barn from a little teeny tiny study. Uh, there are a couple, but they're small and they're very specific patient populations so far. Um, so be aware it's out there. It's a twice a day dose, I'd be five day course of this that worked great in preventing the STIs we care about in people who you know, post, -pro post post sexual activity. Um, but I have no idea where this is gonna go in the big picture. I have no idea what's gonna happen as far as resistance patterns are concerned. So just hang on on that one and just tell people this is in the news a lot, but I'm not sure we're anywhere near ready for prime time. It's going to be great for that photosensitive tan, though. Exactly. Everyone's, Everyone's going to look wonderful good. from yeah. all the photosensitivity. <laughs> exactly. So I just wanted to pop that out there. That's a great thing to talk about is, you know, as you grow in your practice and you're reading literature and you're like, wow, this study suggests I can do this for this patient and help them. An important thing to consider off the bat is what was the patient population yeah. in the study? Is this the patient population that I am seeing? You right. know, how well can I replicate this? And then, and well and then the news media will just take it out of your hands anyway. For sure, exactly. So. Okay, one last one. Who has seen stiff chest syndrome or wooden chest? Really? Ooh, I've seen it oh. once. Yep. Yeah. One time. Once. Um, Scary as hell. Absolutely <laughs> freaking terrifying. Um, and only in a child. Um, because I think it, oh, sorry, I think it really has to do with, <laughs> this is something I don't want to admit. Um, it really has to do with how it's pushed. Yep. So in adults, Typically, this isn't enough to cause a problem. 
um, in an infant uh, with a femur fracture from non-accidental trauma and you're trying to give mm. this person some pain medicine while ortho is manipulating their poor little leg, um, you need to be very careful. And what I would say is it's how you give it. And you're giving such a tiny dose, it's like, well, how do I push that slowly? And what you can do is use a TB syringe, one of the tiny syringes. You can even dilute it with yeah. some normal saline. That's okay to make the volume bigger. So you can actually do this as a slow push. That's what's gonna prevent this. And in my experience, it has been with children. So mm -hmm. because the volume is so small, you can't push it slowly. It's just like, even if you try to, it's just like squirt, like it's tiny and then you flush it and then you just pushed it really fast. So TB syringe, dilute it, mm. push slowly, that's what's gonna prevent this. And real quick, this scare chest right. syndrome, wound chest syndrome has to do with reduced chest wall compliance after giving fentanyl. Um, mm. And so not a thing you want if you have to start pushing on this person's chest. Or, or bagging, bagging them. them. Or bagging exactly. them, you right. can't so bag them. <laughs> just as in this, okay, it's so awful. you've heard about the problem. <sighs> Between the five of us, we've seen Two I've cases seen, of I've this. One. Yeah, one, one and one, right? Mm -hmm. How many dozens, hundred times have we pushed fentanyl on somebody for ACS? Dozens, hundreds of times, right? That so that gives you an idea at how rare this is. I'm gonna roll the dice with this happening versus giving something that throws off their um, hemodynamics by giving morphine or, or, or that a lot. I'd rather give fentanyl in the setting of ACS and be a little more safer on their uh, hemodynamics. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you shouldn't avoid treating people's pain just because of this tiny fear that this is going to happen. It's just when this does happen, they're very, very difficult to manage because you can't bag them. And like I said, it's just how you give it, really. So give it slow and dilute it out yep. so you really can do it slow, and that's what's going to prevent this. This was a huge lesson learned for me as a fellow. If you see this happening, some options are giving naloxone. Narcan, you can reverse this. There are uh, also different, sort of. you know, like paralytic, you know, neuromuscular blocking agents you can Which give don't to. Work very well. um, hopefully, we don't have to go to that, you know, <laughs> that length. But maybe you just treat this like another opioid overdose. Give naloxone slowly and kind of like work them out of this. 